Hello, Herstorians. I'm your host, Heather Ashley, and welcome to another episode of Women of Her Story, a podcast dedicated to celebrating women who have made or are making their mark on our society. Today, I have with me, as always, expert basket maker, Woven Threadless. How are you doing today, Woven? Hello. Hi. Uh, good afternoon. How are you doing? You didn't answer how you're doing. I'm doing just fine. <laughs> I'm sorry. I was so excited. I was ready to greet you. <laughs> I'm doing really well. A few things before we get started today. We will be taking a two-week break from December 20th to January 2nd. And along with our return will be season two. Boop, boop, boop. Season two. And a few really amazing things. We've been we've been working really hard here at women of her story to create not just a podcast but a community of support and networking and second we have decided to leave our merchandise store open indefinitely so make your way to our bonfire store and grab yourself some her story merch or grab your friends some for the holidays grab your family some they make excellent gifts and that sweatshirt is unbelievably comfortable so i hear yeah get that holiday her story uh, merch you know great for uh, uh, you know some stocking stuffers or for uh, getting people aware and um <laughs> You know. They're comfy and they're cute. Yeah, absolutely. So go grab that merch, help us yeah. support her story, and continue uh, assisting us in... Creating um, this podcast for amplifying, you guys. It helps yeah, us. Amplifying voices. Yeah. And without further ado, let's get into today's her story lesson. Joe Starita, author of A Warrior of the People, How Susan LaFleche Overcame Racial and Gender Inequality to Become America's First Indian Doctor, quite a long title for a book, I'll say, mm. wrote, When I got into the research, I was stunned by how deeply entrenched gender bias was in the Victorian era. White women were largely expected to just raise children and maintain a safe Christian home. One can only imagine where that bar was set for Native American women. Susan LaFleche Picote was born in June of 1865 in the northeastern corner of the remote Omaha Territory in Nebraska. Shouts out to Geminis. <laughs> oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's Gemini funny. baby over here. That is you. Mm. She was born during Omaha's summer buffalo hunt to Chief Joseph LaFleche, also known as Iron Eyes. Mm. Before we launch into the path that Susan forged, it is imperative that we first discuss a little bit of background on Chief Joseph LaFleche. Yes, let's. In 1837, Chief Big Elk came back to the Omaha Reservation from an invited trip to Washington with words for his tribe. There is a coming flood which will soon reach us, and I advise you to prepare for it. He shared that the culture of civilization that was spreading was at odds with the Omaha's traditional ways, and to survive they needed to adapt. They needed to learn to accept European cultures and ways into their own to be able to continue to survive. Right before his death in 1853, he chose a man with a similar vision to succeed him as chief of the Omaha tribe. That man was of French and Indian descent, Susan's father, Joseph LaFleche. He pushed for civilization, and this forced a great divide within the tribe. One section was deemed the Young Men's Party, which was open to the incorporation of white customs. And then there was the Chief's Party, consisting of those loyal to traditional medicine men who refused to budge on their traditions. The Young Men's Party built log cabins instead of teepees on the north side of the reservation. The Chief's Party called that part of the reservation the Village of the Make-Believe White Men. It was on this north side of the reservation that Susan and her three older sisters grew up learning how to keep traditions while also keeping their futures open. John Wonder, Professor Emeritus of History and Journalism at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln said, the LaFleche family was adept at learning and adopting languages, religions, and cultures. They never forgot their Omaha culture. <laughs> we might say they enriched it with greater knowledge of their new neighbors. Omaha translates to against the current. Hmm. And Susan embodied this with every fiber of her being. I love that. 
She was educated on the reservation until her early teens, and then she was sent to the Elizabeth Institute for Young Ladies in New Jersey. I hate all of the names of those old types of schools. <laughs> they really bother me. Young ladies, oh, whatever. Young women for science and medicine. <laughs> yeah, you're like, can't it just be? <laughs> There's no young men's school for science and education. <laughs> it's, it's so just weird. school for science and education. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. She was fluent in English and was conversational in French and Otoa. She loved to quote scripture and Shakespeare, and she spent her free time learning to paint and play the piano. When she was 17, she returned to the reservation and taught at the Quaker Mission School on the Omaha Reservation for two years. It was here that she met ethnologist and women's rights advocate Alice Cunningham Fletcher while she was nursing her to health from an illness. Alice saw incredible potential in Susan and helped her through the long process of applying for formal education as a woman and Native American. She helped her get scholarship funds from the U.S. Office of Indian Affairs and the Connecticut Indian Association, a branch of the Women's National Indian Association. Wow. Women helping women. I, uh, you know... I. Uh, you you live to see it, and especially in that sort of environment, it helps that she had someone to look up to and assist her. Um, yeah, who was out? You know, she was she was you know a, a Susan was being exposed to you know all of these, uh, you know of the really the colonization, you know all of these things. Um, but then to when she comes back to her reservation and there's someone there who is a woman's rights advocate and she's like you could do so much let's let's see what we can do for like you and your family and your people yeah. really really amazing just a helping hand like that uh goes a long way absolutely well susan didn't disappoint because she graduated second in her class from hampton normal and agricultural institute in virginia whoa one of the nation's first schools of higher education for non-white students wow yeah it is now the hampton university hmm. during her graduation speech she said we who are educated have to be pioneers of indian civilization the white people have reached a high standard of civilization, but how many years did it take them? We are only beginning, so do not put us down, but help us to climb higher. Give us a chance. I'm glad she's someone that wants to open doors instead of close doors for mm -hmm. people behind her. I think we need more of that mm -hmm. uh, everywhere. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that's something uh, really special about her is she's not... Not to say that anyone um, who left you know, their their tribe and then didn't look back is in any way a bad person. But I like that she was like, okay, I'm I'm going to continue going higher and higher and higher with the outlook of I have to, I have to bring it back to my people. I think that's just so beautiful. And also she's like calling all these people out. She's like, how long did it take you guys to get to this place? Okay. We're, we're just now starting. <laughs> okay. Like give it, give us a chance. And it was here that the resident physician, Martha Waldron, a graduate of the Women's Medical College of Pennsylvania, encouraged her to apply for the school. When Susan was eight years old, she sat at the bedside of an elderly woman dying and in pain. She waited and waited for the white agency doctor to arrive. Over and over, they sent messengers for help, and each time he said he'd be there soon. Just before sunrise, the woman died, and the doctor never did arrive. Ugh. When reflecting on that night, she said, It was only an Indian, and it did not matter. The doctor preferred hunting for prairie chickens rather than visiting poor, suffering humanity. Well, that's just gross. Oh, my gosh. That's my gross my heart individual. dropped when I read that. And, you know... I, it, clearly, from an early age, she saw that, that there was a need for better help. She saw all the injustice that was going around. That That's awful. Like, mm -hmm. you know, uh, any living being should get the same um, sort of care regardless. Yeah. You know? Absolutely. Um, this event stayed with her for her entire life and no doubt opened her eyes at an early age to the incredible need for adequate health care for her tribe. Her father said to Susan and her sisters... Do you always want to be simply called those Indians, or do you want to go to school and be somebody in the world? And I hate that that was, like, a moniker going around. Ugh, 
just those Indians, they don't matter. They're dying. They're sick. They're fine. Just, like, leave them alone. They're... Yeah, the verbiage is absolutely just, disgusting. Ugh. Ugh. Yeah. Susan arrived in Philadelphia for medical school and attended her first class at Women's Medical College of Pennsylvania, the first medical school in the country established for women. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. Where upon graduation, she would become the country's first Native American doctor. Wow. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. She completed the three-year program in two years <laughs> and graduated, drumroll please, valedictorian. Wow. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. hashtag women in... Uh, in STEM. <laughs> yeah, hash, yeah. Yeah. Hashtag women power. That's... That's... Incredible. She definitely, like, was shoving it in their faces, too. Like, mm -hmm. I'm not even going to take the full three years. I'm going to do this. <laughs> I'm going to do your program in two. Yeah. Like, that's I'm gonna, how long... I'm going to... She said they, yeah. they take... She said what was it like that the length was too long like yeah. how, and how long did it take him yeah she's like this is ridiculous yeah and here's the thing um ahead of a time i ahead I, of her time yeah i i don't really go um i didn't want to really go into depth about um you know uh the the education s system was not um looking out for her in a, in applying for places and doing all these things. And it's amazing that there were these women that were championing, championing her. Um, but there was a lot of, of racial discrimination that she suffered through. And, um, yeah, just a lot of, and here's the thing. She that's, could, that's that patriarchy oh, at work ugh. doing the worst. She could, the worst. she could suture wounds, deliver babies, treat tuberculosis. And yet, she was a woman, and she spoke she, three languages. Like, yeah. get out of here. She, yeah. like most women, are overqualified. Yeah. Like, was like yeah. overqualified for the positions that they were either getting or, yeah, you know, could only obtain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, women couldn't vote at this time, and she was Indian, so she wasn't even considered a, ci a citizen under American law. That's joke. Wild. <laughs> and upon her graduation, she completed an internship. And much to the dismay of her colleagues, she left the East behind and made her way back home to the Omaha Reservation. Because she knew, she knew that's where she needed to be. And after her tumultuous path through the sexist and racist Victorian ideals to receive a higher education, she encountered challenges she couldn't have predicted as a physician for the Omaha Agency. The Omaha Agency was operated by the Office of Indian Affairs. We've talked about them. They're not always the looking out for the who they should be looking out for. Mm. They opened up an office in the government boarding school for Susan to provide care for the tribe. Some were sick with tuberculosis, some with cholera, among other things, and some just desperately wanted a clean place to rest. Susan wasn't just their doctor. She was their lawyer, accountant, priest, and political liaison. So many insisted on being treated by Dr. Susan that her white counterpart quit suddenly, making her the only physician on the over 1,300 mile square reservation. Wow. I guess 13... Hundred square mile reservation. Yeah. You know what I meant. No, no, but she is the only. She she's is the only one. one of, yeah, that's because somebody's ego couldn't be checked. <laughs> mind, mind yeah. blowing. Yeah. Those people definitely need more than one purse. Yeah, yeah. That's obnoxious. Yeah. And Susan dreamed of building a hospital for the tribe, but until this could be realized, she would continue her duties. She made house calls on foot, walking through rain, snow, sometimes on horseback and then later in her buggy, traveling sometimes for hours for a single patient, endangering her life. Dang. Some Omahas would even reject her diagnosis and question everything she said, even after making these hours-long trips, because, you know, how they, with rightfully so don't trust a lot of any western ideal any you know sure. european whatever 
Sure. And so because she went to these, you know, white, white higher educations, even, you know, her boarding school she went to, um, you know, they're like, who, who, who's this person? Yeah. Who is? And it was m- most, yeah, it's. They're challenging the institution to which she learned from yes, because, because of they've been treated the ideals of poorly. It. Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and I understand it, you know, they have every right to be skeptical about um, that sort of, uh, mm-hmm. um, that, like, just that right. situation. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just wild to mm-hmm. want to challenge yeah. doctors and yeah. facts yeah. and science. I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially after someone's risking their life. But Yeah, yeah. I mean, the least... Uh, how That's so disrespectful, yeah. though. <laughs> yeah. She led temperance campaigns on the reservation, taking particular issue with white whiskey peddlers that would prey upon the tribe's members. Members would sell clothing, pawn land, and more for a drink. Susan married and had two children, and her husband died from tuberculosis that was made worse by his drinking habit. So that just kind of um, solidified her stop drinking they're doing this to poison us. <laughs> like, this is the only reason why this is here. Sheesh. Yeah. She eventually persuaded the OIA to ban liquor sales in towns formed within the reservation. She opened up a private practice in Bancroft, Nebraska, where she treated white people as well as Indians. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, I think it's very interesting that um, she was such a good doctor that... <laughs> That people, I I hate that I'm even saying this, but that, like, white people were willing to be treated by an Indian woman. You know what I mean? (laughs) Where they're like, uh, women aren't smart enough to vote, but, uh, this lady's pretty smart. I'll let her, I'll, I'll let her examine me. It's it's just kind (laughs) of silly to even, to even have to think about identity when it comes to someone that could be saving your life. Yeah. Like, I, I, I don't care. (laughs) Like, or maybe the opposite of I don't care. Do whatever is supposed to be good for you because that's your, you're entitled to everything that you want. (laughs) But like, if I'm in, if I'm dying, like that's not going, that should never come into play. Like, that's ridiculous. It's crazy. You would rather. You would rather be in pain or die than get, you know, treated um, by, treated by yeah, someone yeah. of color. You're, you're just, <laughs> that, that's why you got sick. Yeah. Because yeah. you're dumb. <laughs> she was an advocate for proper hygiene, using screen doors to keep disease-carrying flies out, and campaigned against communal drinking cups, which I think is insane that that was a thing, but... This actually was to the dismay of many of the tribe members because communal drinking cups are part of part of a culture, but it's also like, well, let's consider, do you have a contagious illness and are we all drinking from said cup? Like, let's, let's think this through. <laughs> it's crazy to think, because I can't imagine, especially in uh, current, con- current con- climate. Current con- climate conditions. <laughs> current climate conditions. Um... Yeah, this drinking cold, this cold from weather. The same. <laughs> drinking from the same cups, you know, it's it's a very it's interesting. But people were upset that she was. Um, they they said she was, you know, going against the Omaha traditions, and she's like, I mean, a little bit, but we can like fake, we can have a fake communal drinking cup, like for ceremonial purposes, and still drink all from our own cups. And people are just like, no, that's wild. You can't limit me. Give me the cup. <laughs> That's my right. <laughs> She's just like, listen, whatever. I, I don't want you to get TB, but uh, yeah, or you know, uh, tuberculosis. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, history's so silly. It's so weird. Well, before her death on September eighteenth, nineteen fifteen, when she was only fifty years old, she had raised enough donations to build a hospital on the reservation town of Walt Hill, Nebraska. This is the first modern hospital in Thurston County. It ran until the late 1940s and later became a care center for the elderly. In 1989, it was beautifully restored and it now displays photos and artifacts from Susan's incredible life. It is called the Susan LaFleche Picote Center and it commemorates her medical work and her family's life. The adversities she faced were incredible. Reputable publications like Popular Science Monthly published numerous articles, one stating that women faced intellectual disadvantages because their brains were smaller than those of men, and that their 
<laughs> oh, this one is insane. And that their menstrual cycles made them unfit for scientific pursuits. What? I don't, I don't <laughs> understand. What? I don't understand um, the thought process behind what? typing that and printing that. In fact, a revered Harvard doctor wrote a 300-page thesis saying that women should be barred from attending college because the stress would harm their reproductive organs. I don't even, um, well, that's just not correct. <laughs> so what about, what about men's reproductive organs? Does the stress not affect theirs? Not if they have a micro penis, <laughs> <laughs> then there's very little stress for that individual. Um, there's almost no stress because you know, Oh my God. But seriously, what this is, this is like a, oh, uh, I, I <laughs> yeah, no, what? I mean, there's really not so, much else to say. I mean, it's, but you, uh, but we shouldn't entertain that. It's like the same thing with like internet trolls. Like, oh, there's yeah. no reason to entertain these people because they're just looking for like they're they're like yeah. they're vying for attention by saying the most asinine things. Like yeah, this, like, this they're man, just threatened. that man who who wrote that is not a scientist. Like you know, he knows nothing. Oh he knew, yeah, he, he knew he knows nothing he, about uh, yeah, the human not, anatomy. He should not be a credible source. <laughs> like. It's just crazy. Yeah, so... Crazy. You, that's dumb. I said it once, and I'll say it again. Omaha means against the current. Susan LaFleche Picote led a revolutionary life defying all stereotypes and expectations. She dedicated her life to helping the Omaha people. And I'm going to leave you guys with a quote. I know that I shall be unpopular for a while with my people because they will misconstrue my efforts, but this is nothing, just so I can help them for their own good. See, we need more uh, selfless people like that in this <laughs> world. Although, that's not to say that we don't, but um, I think too, um, too often the loud voices of the ignorant and and just incorrect un and, yeah. And, yeah and unwilling <laughs> are like way louder than those mm. people with good voices and good intentions so mm -hmm. it's just nice it's nice to um see that even back then there were still um like the forces of good were out there yeah. you know what i mean yeah like, i there were I, still some jedis yeah. you know what i mean <laughs> i think you know it's kind of back to her making these trips knowing like you know hours in her buggy or horse or on foot, knowing full well that there's a high likelihood that the person is going to deny or, or, or going to refute her diagnosis. But she's like, I'm going to go anyway. I'm going to bring them the medicine. They can take it or not, but I'm going to do it. And they're not going to like me, but it doesn't matter. I don't need them to like me. I just need them to be okay. Yeah. She wasn't doing, yeah, she wasn't doing that to gain like a, a exactly. you know, popularity. She was trying to save lives. And I think that's what we need at the end of the day in science. You know what I mean? Yes. Like that level of impartiality. Yeah, sure. Where it's just like, um, you know, like I'm not trying to have people like me. I'm trying to, yes. I'm trying to do my job. Yes. Like, you know, yeah. I, Mm hmm Absolutely. It's just, this isn't about you liking me. This isn't about not a anything contest. Yeah. other than, I'm trying this to isn't save about my ego. Or my yeah. skin color, or my gender, it's mm -hmm. or my identity. It's the fact that I could save your life if you have tuberculosis. <laughs> but if you'd rather die of that because I'm a woman and a, and a woman of color at that, I'm going to go, I'll get on my horse because I have a 16-hour ride. Yeah, she's like, I'll leave you with the meds. You believe, God I'm damn, 16 hours. <laughs> no one said this was going to be part of the job. <laughs> Damn, it is cold. <laughs> nah, I'm leaving. Forget it. I don't know what the diagnosis is. I, I gotta go. You wasted my time already. <sighs> 17 hours now talking to you. You dumbass. <laughs> that's a direct quote. Except that's not her. <laughs> that's a direct quote from me. From her. <laughs> that's that's quote what... that. <laughs> oh my god. Well, thank you, historians, for tuning in again. Come back this Friday for an interview with New York Assemblywoman and New York City Council candidate Carmen De La Rosa. Pew, 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 pew. In this interview, she talks about some of the initiatives she's been most proud of, why representation matters, the importance of her support system, and so much more. Subscribe, rate, review, and help us share amazing stories just like this one. 
Follow us on social media on Twitter at The Her Story Pod, Instagram at Women of Her Story Podcast, and visit our website at Of Her Story.com. And until Friday, be safe, stay healthy, and show the world what you're made of. Wear a mask. Bye. Bye.